Welcome everyone to the Shift Left Reliability Community Meetup. Um, today's meet will be slightly different to our evening sessions. Obviously, we're running it yeah. during lunchtime. Um, the idea is to make this um, session as interactive as possible. Um, so there will be an open discussion at the end of the talk today. So we'd love for everyone on the call to contribute where possible to some of the topics that we're going to raise. Um, so first up, we're gonna hear from the engineering team at News UK, um, and then we'll take some questions and then this will lead nicely into our open discussion, which will be led by CTO and co-founder of Reliably, Sylvain, um, who will give us a wave later. <laughs> so now I'm gonna hand over to Stoyan and Krasimir to kick off um, by sharing how they're building reliable and resilient systems. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, first of all, hi everyone, really excited to be part of the community. Um, what we are going to pretty much talk is uh, what we are building in News UK and give you some insights how we deal with reliability with, and all the different um, best practices that we try to implement, who we are. Uh, um, as you can see on the slide, my name is Stoyan Yanev. I'm a principal engineer here in News UK. Uh, my focus is AWS, Kubernetes, automation, um, different bits in the infrastructure. And my hobby is uh, reading books and uh, creating Legos with my son. Hello, everyone. I'm Krasimir Petrov. It might be a mouthful to say, but no worries. I'm a senior software engineer at News UK. I have around seven years experience in software development. I've worked in media, banking, gaming, travel and booking, and uh, all types of businesses. But right now, my main focus is growing and improving my DevOps skills to a new level. So I'll hand over to Stuyan so we can kick this off. Uh, yeah. So first of all, I'd like to start with who's News UK, actually. Uh, News UK is one of the largest publishing companies in the UK. We own big news brands and publishers like The Times, The Sun, uh, uh, Sunday Times, and Wireless. You could see them on the different slides. Maybe some of them are, um, maybe you know some of them. Um, in recent years, the shift towards the digital media space has become even more rapid. Uh, and traditional newspaper sales follow the general move uh, towards online everything. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I'm going to tell you a quick story about News UK and how we decided to build a design system and why what we've ended up is actually creating much more than that. Uh, as one might imagine, uh, these huge publishing corporations are underpinned by a number of technology teams. Each publisher requires a number of performance table and customer-friendly websites, which are built using a collection of different interface components. For example, when the time decides they want to build an index page, that page will be constructed using a variety of article cards. The same need exists for The Sun or indeed any other of the many News UK publications. Uh, in the current world, multiple product teams will spend resources on building an article card component in their own unique way uh, to satisfy the needs of their business uh, stakeholders. Um, uh, these components have traditionally looked and behaved a little differently, but in essence are a variation of a common base component. This is how we decided to create our own ecosystem of products, uh, one for our front-end news kit and one unified backend, which is the news kit API. Um, the next slide. Uh, we'll, today, our session will focus mostly on news kit API. News kit API serves as a unified data point for the news kit ecosystem. It is built based on the idea of federated GraphQL architecture powered by Apple server and Apple Federation. The inception of news kit API was driven by both challenges in our existing uh, tech stack and the direction of NewsKit to advocate consistency, reliability, efficiency, and best user experiences. Over the years, some of our existing products have grown organically, both in complexity and size. To construct a single page, one of our titles has to make 
20 post requests uh, to a different REST API endpoints, one for the navigation bar, one for the main article body, um, more requests for the article metadata, and some other requests for the user-generated content, a few more for rich media, and many, many third-party partners. The list goes on. Worst is that uh, only a tiny portion of the fetched data is used. Most of them are discarded. This is very inefficient and expensive, as you can imagine. GraphQL uh, helped us solve the issue of in the increasing demand for dynamic data from front-end applications. Clients can now get all and only the required data to construct the UI via a single query. This can drastically reduce the complexity and performance of the front-end systems. We took an incremental approach for our GraphQL adoption through GraphQL Federation and the idea behind federated architecture. This enabled us to iterati iteratively expand our schema to make the API usable immediately, delivering value to the business. Um, as you can see from the diagram, we have a lot of different data sources. Uh, but let's talk about the actual implementation of the project. Uh, next slide, please. What technologies exactly do we use? Uh, first, the code itself, we rely heavily on TypeScript, Node.js, and GraphQL. Our infrastructure resides in AWS. Due to the high traffic and scaling needs, we went with Kubernetes and EKS. Our cluster is running around 2,000 pods, uh, which is not solely used for the API needs. We also have other, other projects running as part of our cluster. Just to give you some perspective of the traffic, we're talking about uh, several billion requests per month. Uh, all our infrastructure, infrastructure sorry, is done via uh, infrastructure as code. We use Terraform and previously we had CloudFormation, serverless frameworks, and we, we've pretty much gone through all the different options. Uh, what we wanted to do is find a way to guarantee high availability no downtime and no performance issues. Each mistake or a minute of downtime is really costly for us. We started by making sure we have an optimal test coverage, unit tests, integration tests, mode tests, end-to-end -end tests, load tests, pretty much you name it, we have it. After that, we decided to go with the concept of PR environments. Each new pull request creates a, new, a whole new environment which can be used to test and verify the application behavior. Something else that we are proud of is that pretty much everything is automated. Our CI CD process requires minimum uh, human interaction, but my colleague Krasi will go into much more details. I'll try and go over some of our more important safety measures we have in our API. Um, of course, naturally that will start off with our CI CD. And to start off, the first step would be when an engineer is pushing any changes to our code base. So we have these Git hooks in place. And for those, we are using a tool called Husky. And you can use it to lint your commit messages, run tests, um, lint your code. Um, and all of this is done when you commit or push. We use pre-commit hooks and pre-push hooks with Husky, and that ensures all engineers have taken care of their test coverage and linting on their changes every time they introduce a new change to the project. Um, we also have, as Tian mentioned, a lot of environments. We have pull request environment, dev environment, staging and production environments. And this enables us to test our features in live conditions easily. Um, the pull request environment is created by a trigger from GitHub whenever a pull request is opened, pointing to some external services and resources being live on the dev environment. Engineers can easily test uh, the new features they introduce before even merging their code into the master branch. So basically the PR environment resembles the dev environment and the staging and prot environments are almost 100% identical with a little bit of exceptions here and there. But yeah, we, we try to keep them as identical as possible. And we also make use of, we, we are using Helm charts in USKIT API, 
um, which is really helpful when deploying. We make use of the tax that that's generated to check what pieces of the application are actually updated when a pull request is created. And then we trigger only the necessary workflows inside of Circle CI, which results in no unnecessary redeployments of resources. We only deploy what we have actually changed every time. Um, we have, as Tian mentioned in a previous slide, we are making use of a federated GraphQL schema. And on each deployment we do, we're comparing if there are changes within the GraphQL schema of each wrapper that we have, plus the federated schema in the gateway. For these checks, we're using a tool called GraphQL Inspector. Um, this is really helping us prevent pushing breaking changes to the schema, resulting in queries or mutations not working properly for our clients. Um, so we call the live schema that's being used on production a schema reference, and it's kept on our own S3 bucket in AWS. So when a new deploy is finished, we're pushing the latest passing schema, updating the reference for future checks in the upcoming PRs. Uh, we also are making use of this, call, of this tool called Learner. Um, we are using it to generate change log on each release we make. Uh, we are also using it to be uh, Learner, first of all, is the tool that's used for managing monorepos uh, with Git. We use it to bump the versions of the underlying packages in the project based on the changes we made. We also use strict versions on dependencies inside the project because splitting up large code bases into separate independently versioned packages is extremely useful for code sharing between all, all the packages inside of the monorepo. And Learning is taking care of all of that. So if you're not familiar with it, definitely worth to have a look into the tool. It's really useful. Um, in terms of testing our projects, we are using a few different tools. We have unit tests. Um, we have 100% coverage of unit tests on all of the wrappers we have, plus the gateway, which is keeping the, the super graph, which is the federated schema. Uh, for that, we are using Jest. We also have 100% coverage on the functional tests, which are again using Jest. Um, we have performance, also known as load tests. And for these, we're using Taurus plus Blaze Meter. And really br briefly, Taurus is an automation tool that uses different executors. And we're making use of JMeter. And what that, that, what that does is basically you create a test scenario and the tool starts to simulate requests from a lot of users to a selected service with different intensity like concurrency, a ramp up of traffic, iterations, and a whole lot of other, a whole lot of other modifications. Um, and Blaze Meter is the tool that we use to read the reports that are coming from different test, run, test runs that Taurus did. So it's really visible on how things are going in there. We also have the schema tests. These are the tests I've mentioned in the previous slides. We do them for all of the subgraphs in each wrapper and the federated supergraph. We have contract testing, which is for which we use PACT. If you're not familiar, um, in simple terms, there are the tests in which you create a contract between two services, which is basically a stopped request response. And when you deploy a service, you verify your service response against this contract to make sure that the other services subscribe don't receive invalid or wrong messages. So it's basically a, something like a schema contract between the two services. And finally, we have federation end-to-end -end tests, which are only run 
on our gateway. And these are tests that use live instances of the gateway. Whenever all images are spinned up and running, we're sending a real request to the gateway in which we use fields that are federated between at least two services down here, let's say between service A and service B. Um, that ensures that federated types are working correctly. And there are no stops or mocks involved in these tests. They're just using live data. So we, we are getting back a real response from our underlying data sources That's that they are behind the services. And that's mostly all of, all of the testing we have in USKIT API. Um, just to give you an overview for, for like one more specific case of safety measures, we are leveraging health checks on deployment. Uh, health checks allows us to implement safeties into our applications, such as users, measures that prevent users of getting served incorrect data or the supergraft is failing to build correctly. And they also account for a wide range of uh, error conditions in which the app can become as as it's called, unhealthy. So for example, a resource exhaustion or some sort of failure to connect to the upstream services due to network conditions may be a case of which a service may be unhealthy because the gateway is dependent on the other services to build its own super graph. So Kubernetes services generally, generally will not add a pot to the pods that are routable until the pods enters this uh, status of ready. So this is determined by Kubernetes and ready status is based on either uh, these kind of health checks being set up or all of the containers in the pods are running. So the way we do the check is we're making an HTTP request against the TCP at the configured endpoint of where the pods are and a status code between 200 and 400 is okay. And this allows the application to be clear about its health, sorry, and generates a lock uh, that could be pretty useful when you debug issues. So we're sure that before the gateway is ready to be started, all the required pods are, that provide subgraphs are running. So the subgraph could be composed without any hassle. Um, we have monitoring in NewSkit API. For the monitoring, we use NewSkit, uh, sorry, uh, we have built a NewSkit custom plugin for New Relic, and we have excellent observability with New Relic uh, with its APM dashboards and alert, alerts that it's providing. Uh, some of the most used features are the distributed tracing, um, the error rates and logs. We are seeing a lot of throughput information in there. We have visibility over the Kubernetes pods, health and utilization. For example, how much percentage of the CPU, CPU is utilized on a pod or the memory and stuff like that. We can easily analyze what's going on with the pods. Um, as I said, we have customized this GraphQL plugin for New Relic. So we are able to have separate dashboards for each of uh, for each different wrapper we have, and this provides a lot of insights on how they are scaling, what traffic is going through each one of them. We can that can be easily used to narrow our investigations if there are any problems occurred, and um, we also have different alarms. Um, they are set up using this query language, which is called New Relic, uh, New Relic Query, yeah, it's NRQL, New Relic Query Language. And these letters are based on thresholds, um, periods, spikes of errors, and whatever you may think of, you can, you can set it up with a simple query using their language. And all of this monitoring is deployed to New Relic using Terraform, same as our application is. So everything is really organized in there. And finally, I, 
as I mentioned on the previous slide, uh, we do have alarms triggered by New Relic. Um, we're using those to send messages and notifications to the teams responsible for the services which are failing in some way. Uh, we are mostly relying on Slack channels, and these Slack channels are set up specifically for that purpose. So when we receive a notification from Slack bot, uh, this is the bot that's sending the messages to the Slack channels, an engineer would go and investigate what the issue might be. The useful thing about these notifications is that they are providing a link leading directly to the issue that triggered the alarm in New Relic. Um, this target right here. So it's a lot easier to recognize where the problem might be and re react to it faster. Um, additionally, we have on call Rota in US UK, in which engineers are available at outside of working hours. So each team has a run book, uh, which is a document with the most commonly occurring problems and a step by step solution for them which enables all engineers from other teams to provide support to different teams whenever that's possible. Of course, if there's nothing like, if it's a trivial problem, it could be easily solved using this document. And that roughly covers some of the safety measures we have. Uh, we'll be happy to answer some questions if you, if you may have some questions. Great. Well, thank you so much for, for sharing those insights. Um, that was really, really great. Um, I think, yeah, as you say, we'll now head over to questions. So if everyone wants to, you know, please join us um, by being on camera. Um, if you want to pop a question into the chat or feel free to come on camera and unmute um, and ask your question. You've mentioned there a couple of times that you've got 100% test coverage on a lot of, a lot of things. Um, but based off that, sort of how much of your time would you say is is spent writing tests as opposed to uh, actual function. Um, oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, my answer would be, um, it's hard to tell because initially it takes a lot of time to, to set everything up. So if you are just starting a project and if you want to follow that approach, I would say that more than 50% would be writing tests initially. Once you have the project going and like all the configurations, all the pipelines created, all the all the, all the configs, pretty much, it's I would say twenty to thirty percent time is writing tests because when you get the hang of it, it's it's pretty much the same every time. So it's it gets really fast at one point, but the initial configuration is it really takes time, especially when you use different tools, because one thing is writing unit tests. After that, you try to add, for example, load tests. After that, you end-to-end -end tests. And most of the time taken is having that initial configuration uh, ready. Once you have that, it's, I would say it's kind of, it, it's really fast after that. Plus, um, currently we're not using, but there are many options for, uh, test generation tools, which is something that I think at, at least in the near future should be explored. Um, there are many tools in different software right now that based on your code and functions, it could create at least the main tests and then you could fill, fill the gaps with some edge cases, et cetera. Uh, so yeah, you could, you could adapt different approaches to that one. Brilliant, thank you. Also, as I mentioned, we have these pre-hooks, uh, which really um, stops you from pushing anything without having 100% coverage. So you don't really have a choice at some point because you have to have everything covered that you push. It's kind of uh, annoying in the beginning, but it's kind of, I think it's more of getting used to this rather than if you have the time or not. Um, maybe, maybe uh, initially, yeah, especially with those utility functions that you reuse like a thousand times in the different projects. So having those being uh, covered by tests is probably the most time consuming thing. And after that, you reuse most of your code, even for new stuff, there are um, many bits that you could reuse. So they're already tested. 
which again saves time in the long run. Yeah, exactly. We try to. If, if, if I can piggyback on, on that question, uh, that, that, that answer, um, does this apply to, because automation brings a lot of obviously sweetness when it's ready and there, uh, but <clears throat> have you found that that, that sort of, of you know, maintenance and, and initial cost to be apply, applicable to everything else? Like, <clears throat> I know, for example, in our, <laughs> in our teams, uh, we're using GitHub Actions and, and therefore GitHub and GitHub Actions. But we haven't really uh, invested the time yet to make those GitHub Actions easy to just, you know, reuse basically uh, in many contexts. So our reuse quite often is just copy paste. So therefore, obviously, you end up with <laughs> things that you don't carry along and stuff like that. So how do you manage the, the automation in itself, basically? Do, do you have like... Uh, almost like a dedicated team of people that look after all of that, or is it you as part of your daily work? You also have a bit a slice specific for that. Um, it's in News UK mostly. It's each team. Uh, we, we try to follow that principle by Amazon. So each team try to tries to take ownership of the whole product. So we we do our own automation, but um, there are many bits which we try to do in a way that they could be reused and shared between teams. What I mean by that is, for example, um, we use a lot extensively Kubernetes, which means that even though each project is very individual, there are we reuse so much templates with Helm that it's right now, if someone tells us, okay, we need a new service, we have like 80 to 85% of the infrastructure already prepared as, as, as templates. Like it's, it looks kind of like Lego. There are different bo blocks that you could pick or skip based on your needs. But the infrastructure is really into templates right now. It took us probably a year to get into that position, but right now, whatever we have to build, it's mostly just picking different blocks and, and reusing them. The pipelines, Pipelines, we currently, we've used many things uh, previously, like uh, Team City, now with Circle CI. Um, that migration wasn't easy. Uh, you have to copy paste, you have to adapt syntax, et cetera. But now that we are in Circle CI, um, the good thing about Circle CI is that it's a, it's a single configuration file, even though it's long. Again, you could reuse all the, what we try to do in Circle is extract um, smaller tasks into uh, like a job configuration, which could be used. For example, uh, passing credentials, assuming roles, um, SSH connections, or things that you have to do at some point in every pipeline. We have them as a job, which is really easy to just plug into the new pipeline. It's a single a single line of code that has to be added. Um, so for most stuff, it's, um, again, trying to create different templates. That's time-consuming initially. But after that, even now, if I have to automate a service, we could pretty much create a new service in a day, one or two days with the whole pipeline set up with PR environments, with uh, CI, CD process, Pretty much every, everything is there for us to, to start building, which is, um, it, it, I would say it depends on the, the context of the company. For example, in News UK, we know that we build products that have to stay. So it's um, the environment, even though it's dynamic, I'm pretty sure that the Sun and the Times as brands and as publishing companies, will publishing brands will be here to stay. So uh, we, we go for the long run pretty much. It, for us, we made the decision that it's okay to, to lose a week initially, but I know that this application will work for the next two, three, or five years, and it will save me so much time along the way if I have to um, extend it or to update something. So creating those templates and those um, pipelines, which are really easy to, to recreate, is something that we uh, we did initially, but now it's it's so easy that uh, they, we don't need an extra DevOps engineer or even our engineers without too much DevOps knowledge could 
just reuse what we've had. We have run books, like um, that's an, another thing. You need documentation, like having templates is not gonna help if people don't know how to use them or how to order them in order to, to do the job. So we, uh, we sit together as a team for one or two days and just created a full documentation. You have to follow these steps, use these templates, these are the different options that you could use. This is how you could ex uh, like remove some bits or add some additional ones. And now just the person without DevOps knowledge, if he goes through all those steps and templates, he could actually build a new service which follows all the best practices we learned over time. And I know that he can't uh, harm our infrastructure because we've set like safeguards or configurations that will... Uh, prevent someone like leaking data or creating like an instance which will be with a hundred pods which is unnecessary and will cost us too much so yeah um that's a lot of uh time spent on initial setup which uh actually it, it's really good for us long term and um, another thing that it helps is that even though for example we have several really good experts in uh, Kubernetes, DevOps, etc. If some of them goes go away for one or two weeks on a holiday or something like that, yeah, and we need to uh, add new service or do something new or something breaks, we already have the mechanisms to to do it on our own. So we are able to substitute each other in the different teams, which is uh, again really what big plus. We don't have someone who's like um, a stopper, like someone goes to a holiday and you, you're in panic that if something breaks or if, if you have to do something new, that you just have to wait until the person comes back. That's something that I've seen in other companies. It, it was also like a similar position in US UK, like more than two years ago, like you had some domain knowledge expert, which was very into Kubernetes or some other bits. He was so good that he did the most important bits and other people reused it, but they didn't understand it. So uh, when he goes on a holiday or if he changes position, like it, everyone's scared how, how to actually ad adapt that service or, or maintain it. But uh, with everything being into templates and having a really nice documentation, we're, we, we feel much more comfortable um, with our teams and uh, uh, with our engineers. If anyone has any further questions, please do move along. <clears throat> yeah, hello, everyone. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it, it was really good to see that sort of, 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 of talk today. And, and, and I hope we can indeed continue the discussion, as just uh, Adelta said. The, in recent weeks, I've had uh, excellent uh, um, talks with various sort of people from SRE engineers, head of engineering or, you know, at various levels. And what I realized was <clears throat> why there is a north for all of us to get, you know, to that sort of level and, and obviously better, uh, not everyone is there. Sometimes you arrive and you see engineers almost with that, that look on the face when, when at lunchtime you're really hungry and you see that pastry over there and you really just want to go at it, you know, it's uh, and, but you can't get there yet. It's... Um, we have legacy. I mean, uh, and when we don't have legacy, we have time constraints. We have to go forward. We have to, you know, it's it's not easy to, I found, to, um, you know, prioritize operational healthiness. And and it's great to see um, at News UK they've managed to prioritize that. I'd be, I'd, I'd love to hear if it was the management uh, requirements or if the teams pushed hard enough that they couldn't, you know, stop, you know, they, they, they couldn't basically ignore that. Because I think we are all in the same boat here at, from an engineering perspective where we all go through companies where we feel, uh, you know, things were broken enough in the operations that I couldn't actually deliver what I wanted. Either it make me simply leave, sometimes it happens. I've left a company because of, of that, to be honest, because when you fight and you fight and you fight, at some point you just have to go and 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 if they don't want to listen, you have to 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 move basically. But sometimes also it's because you just there is no uh, buying basically. So I I guess my my first question is is perhaps it's not so much a question of a comment. How do you does everyone who's here? Uh, I see a bunch of you have, 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 
have been kind enough to um, to 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 show their faces, which is not always easy. I'd love to hear from from you folks about where you at uh, in 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 that journey. Uh, are you coming here today just to because that's where you want to be, <laughs> uh, and you know in a, in in some time, or is it you're already there and you just want to like compare notes? Basically, it, it'd be lovely to see where where you're coming from uh, on this one on operations. So I don't want to name names. So if anyone has the the, the passion enough to actually take the microphone, please go ahead. Uh, I'd, I'd love to hear that. So if anyone wants, wants to share their, their, their story, it'd be lovely. Yeah, so just, uh, I guess, um, on your point, you know, in terms of how we manage, actually, I'm, I'm from New UK as well. Actually, I initially worked with, um, on this product uh, with the guys. So I guess I'm now probably more on the management that side of things. So I can share a bit, you know, how we did it. I think one thing we were lucky because it was more of a, a greenfield project back days. So we made it sure everyone was acquired, like, you know, DevOps mindset and everything. And we scaled the team in that area. So we never, how to say, we always had like quality and everything as our top priority. We never compromised anything. So I think that helped set that mentality from right from the beginning in terms of saying, you know, keep moving forward. And also how do we deal with the sort of tech data things? I think uh, uh, apart from being quite strict with ourselves, the other thing is uh, we always um, you know, understand the business has to get value out of it. I think for us, it's more of, uh, you know, what we do every time refactoring stuff, we do ask ourselves what the business value we get out of that, what can we give to business? It's more of transparent conversation and uh, also the team guys been doing really well. So, you know, every time when we say if we need to add new features, Actually, we need to look at, do we need to refactor? Do we need to make things better in order to move fast? So we're not just going to bolt something on. I think it's just that mentality for team is very important because, you know, if you factor all that things into the cost of the feature, it's what it is that actually makes subsequent new features much faster because you have a healthier system. So yeah, that's sort of our experience so far. I think you know it worked, but then again, I know in a lot of companies when you go in, it's already a legacy system. But again, I think you can yeah do similar things probably yeah gradually improve things. So I thank you very much for that insight. It's it's useful. Um, I, I you know I I think that. Uh, that greenfield obviously makes it easy, but at the same time, you're right about the business value, at least even, and, and I can say that because it happens in our own company and some of the people here could actually vouch for that. Um, while engineers do love, I think, you know, engineering, <laughs> there is a need for, to know what you're building, right? And and it's it's good to have that north, uh, nonetheless. It's not, and when the business is considered as, as the north and our users and not necessarily as, um, a constraint, which I've seen, you know, in past companies, I've seen where basically engineers would consider anything coming from product teams or, or wherever as like, because they just wanted to, I wouldn't say geek around, but they didn't know, they don't understand the, the North. They, there was no understanding from engineers, but, you know, it was not the fault of engineer. It was just a system that uh, that worked this way, right? It, it's just, you know, siloed and, and it, it, it didn't work basically. Um, but I know at, at least at Reliably when a, a lot of things unlock when people understood what we were building and, and therefore it's, it's also better for, for me to understand when the, the team pushes back because I say, I, we need to fix this first. Uh, it, it, and when that, that discussion becomes healthy like that, it's, it's very valuable. And that's indeed, it's, it's when we start actually going faster, bizarrely enough. <laughs> so I can relate to that completely. Um, yeah, does anyone, you know, I don't want to certainly, because I can talk all, all, all you know, the 20 minutes left or whatever. So I just don't want to do that. So anyone has, uh, you know, not necessarily questions about uh, News UK, although obviously it's welcome, but 
anything in particular uh, I'd love to hear. Because otherwise, I'm going to ask questions, but you know, it's going to be me. So. <laughs> I can be me. I'm fine. You know, I like hearing my own voice. <laughs> uh, maybe you you need to to have food. Uh, no, I, I think it's interesting because this this meetup is reliability, obviously reliability, and and we as reliability we partner that. But one thing I've I've come to to realize is reliability sometimes is not like doesn't seem to have its space. And I, I would be interested to know in your in your own you know companies or, or places like that. What what you see? I've 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 seen security become a thing, right? So you have a team for security. You have you know, and it's well understood. They usually now have a, quite a lot of power because it's becoming a problem if you're not secure. But reliability, quite 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 often, I'd say not always, but it's a bit of a it's a magical mystical being, right? It happens, or it doesn't, <laughs> and then it's an incident. But there is no I I can't find always. We have a sorry and some some people some teams like that, but in general it's it's about like and if I'm a bit cheeky, you know some some companies where well we're in, we're in the cloud so we are reliable, and I find that a little, <laughs> a little short to think like that. So I'd be interested to know if, as part of everything you've built, reliability as a topic, as a goal, as a as a foundation for for what you've built, you know, in any uh, a team or any company has become something that is just as important as other things, or if it's much more about still ethereal still. So I'd, I'd love to have that because uh, twi quite too often it seems to be a topic that is not addressed specifically. Um, uh, yeah, I, I could share my my two cents. Something that even when, when uh, we decided to do a talk and it was like the focus would be reliability, but we sat with sat together with Krasi and we were thinking, okay, but what exactly does the reliability include? Like how far does it stretch? Which topics exactly are included in reliability? Because as you said, it's a really broad field and that some people would understand it kind of differently. Um, for us, reliability includes everything that we could pretty much do to make sure that we're operational. Like, um, tests, verifications, validations, or, or anything that could uh, prevent us from, from having any downtime. So it's a really broad topic. Mm. Um, as, as you saw from, from, um, from the presentation, we first of all, we try to add as many tests as possible, but that at least from experience show that it's not always uh, it's not always a uh, hundred percent sure that it's it's gonna work without any hiccups or any problems. Especially when you test on a separate environment and then you deploy to production, which is a whole new, different animal, different environment with different specifics. And uh, having everything deployed in the cloud, sometimes it, yeah, people think it's 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 easy because AWS or GCP or Azure provide you with so many different services, but you have to do a lot of work to actually make sure that they to get the value out of those services. Um, for example, something that uh, that we're looking into these days and uh, will probably be a next step uh, for the company would be uh, chaos engineering. So resilience testing. That's something that it's uh, really hard to, to, to validate and to understand without having the capability to actually go and try to destroy your own system and uh, make sure that all those different services with fancy names are actually going to scale or are they going to continue work if there are any problems, especially in the cloud, like a whole region could go, could get down or brought down or there might be some network problems and most of the time people guess what's actually going to happen but you you can't you can't test it is like i can't just switch aws off for like two minutes and see what's going to happen so um at least for us we we had a very uh interesting tech hurdle about that and uh what we're going to do is probably uh get in, into uh chaos testing and uh, that's a that's an approach that pretty much Netflix made uh, uh, popular. But um, there are many 
more and more companies are getting into that. And I believe that uh, the, the applications we built today are already really complex, to be fair. You have CDS, you have sto different storages, you have virtual machines or clusters or um, load balancers, everything's in the cloud. And it's really hard to, 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 to know how the whole system is going to react when something happens. And um, just testing on, on test environment, dev environment, et cetera, it's, uh, you, can't, you can't actually test everything or see all the, all the potential problems. Uh, something that, for example, uh, was a problem with us last year is that, okay, AWS has auto-scaling for the databases, et cetera, but with our demand and our traffic, that's not enough that it takes three, four, five minutes to spin new instances. We need it to be faster. What can we do to actually solve those problems? And um, many times you, what we do is we work very closely with AWS to try to, we, sometimes we even in, in, are in a position to request new features. We're like, we're using this, here's our use case. Can, can you suggest something? And there are many times that even they are like, um, uh, we're not sure which service exactly is gonna fix your problems. So it's, um, I believe our era is like the technology in the industry is growing so fast that uh, there are still so many problems that have to be solved. Uh, and uh, I believe that security was really important until now, but more and more reliability will be a, a hot topic because uh, j people now see that just being in the cloud doesn't mean that you're highly available or you're going to scale fast enough, or you might suddenly end up with a bill, which is crazy high, just, just to just some small mistake in one configuration file. So yeah, it's, um, it's a really uh, big topic. And that's something that we each day we try to read and be up to date with everything to actually understand um, how to improve our systems. Uh, just uh, from from um, I've seen. <clears throat> so you, you have a very uh, big automation like a pipeline, like a lot of, of of us have, you know, and maybe not so advanced. But I think a lot of people here probably have a similar pipeline. With you know, once the, the code is pushed, things happen in some places. Circular CI, uh, Jenkins for 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 the old timers like me, um, and and maybe GitLab or, or places like that. I. I wonder if you, if anyone, and not just you at News UK, but generally speaking, if you've heard or if you've seen um, a, a point where you realize that your operations become a system that needs monitoring in itself. Because, for example, we use GitHub, like I said, GitHub Actions, and therefore the whole GitHub you know, uh, platform at Reliably. And about a month ago or something like that, GitHub kept being off, right? And to us, it was an operational problem because we couldn't do anything anymore. So it slowed us down as well. Um, and then I started to realize I'm not even paying attention uh, to the logs that are there. So I pay attention if a failure happens and I'll go and look at the logs. But I then realized my whole pipeline is actually a system in itself. So while the system we produce, we deliver is a system for the end user, we have our own system as well. By creating automation, we make a lot of things extremely nice and convenient, but that becomes yet another system that needs to be looked after and, and understood what to do. I remember, it's, it's, it's a true story, by the way, and I'm not making this one up. Um, about whatever years ago, uh, probably four years ago, I was with um, Russ Miles and we were on the train and I was meant to actually deliver to update a code, so I had to push. And the day before, we used Travis CI at that stage. Travis went down. I couldn't do that, so I couldn't do the whole pipeline. So I ended up on the train without Wi-Fi. I actually plugged my 4G phone as Wi-Fi, and I managed to do that from the train uh, manually. And and you realize, you know, it happens as well, right? All systems become things that we we depend on. So I depend for ourselves on API from GitHub, their platform. Um, at Reliably, we're using Stripe for payments. So we use, we base on that. So if they go down, everything goes down, or at least a specific user journey goes down. Uh, in this case, the user journey is you as engineers. If it goes down, 
what do you do right so i wonder how first of all if 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 people have sort of realized that they have to also or, almost bring observability into their pipeline to look after it and how they they consider that how they consider the fact that they own pipeline has become something that they have to look after like any other system obviously it's it could be a bit of a endless loop because what you do about the thing that monitors the thing but i wonder anyway if if anyone gets at that stage where their own pipeline has become not necessarily complex but um critical i think that it needs looked after yeah, I, I could i could share our uh Thoughts. Maybe Krasi could add more details, but uh, we understood that pretty fast. Just because our pipelines are they're really big and sometimes they're complex with many dependencies, like each environment, for example, you can't deploy on staging if you haven't deployed to dev, you can't deploy to production without staging. In dev. There are many, many uh, um, dots that you have to connect to actually uh, be able to release. And uh, many things could go wrong, like one full cycle from PR to, to production is like, I don't know, maybe 30, 40 jobs, maybe more sometimes, which at every single point, there could be some failure or something not being configured, or I don't know, some test might, might be failing, some uh, network problems could happen on a particular, a particular environment. And uh, when I started building those, we uh, immediately understood that it's, if it's a black box, that automation could actually make it worse for us than actually doing it manually. Because it's if I don't understand what's happening at each point of time, and if I can't debug it easily, then I could end up in a situation when I can't actually release for a day or two if something happens and I don't understand it. So uh, we have different tools to actually help us. One of them uh, is that the, our pipelines uh, have a separate Slack messages that they push notifications what's actually happening. For example, if there's a new deploy in any environment, we we have logs and we have messages in a particular Slack channel. We have alarms if something's actually broken in, inside, even inside the pipeline. And if it's something more critical, like you try to deploy to production, but it fails for some reason, like it was successful in the previous two environments, but in, in production it fails. There are emails being sent to the team members, etc. So we tried to um, we tried to go for further away from that black box kind of a setup and and understand at each point in time what is the pipeline doing? Is it in okay status or is it failing somewhere? And have uh, the good thing about uh, Circle CI is it helps a lot because it has many integrations. So uh, we could send emails, send notifications to Slack, or or different bits that could actually and help us understand that there's something happening which we haven't expected. And other than that, uh, very often, like if something breaks, you have to actually have an easy way to, to log into that particular machine and see what's happening. Why is it breaking here in, and working on any other environment? And um, yeah, sooner or later, you will have to SSH in some of those instances to see what, what's the cause of it. But uh, I guess, yeah, that you definitely need monitoring. The, the more complex that automation gets, the more visibility you need to actually understand what's happening. And another thing is that um, we have an interesting strategy, something that Karasi mentioned with tags. So different pipelines are triggered by different tags. And I know, uh, for example, if there aren't any code changes that particular workflows are not going to get triggered, or I know that uh, if a particular new tag is created, that um, some of the pipelines were already successful. So it's a, I, I wouldn't say it, it, there isn't an easy answer, uh, but you definitely need to find ways to, to, to understand what's happening in your pipeline at every single moment. And uh, always try to leave like a backdoor. It, you, you're always thinking about the happy path, 
but sooner or later there might be some like crucial fix or crucial problem that you have to fix and be able to deploy immediately like it could happen once every five years or three years but if such thing happens you need to have a fast way to pretty much flip the switch and and and, and try to release with, without going to all the tests and like because what we saw is that for example the whole workflow with us because we have many environments many tests it could take like more than 30 minutes sometimes to to deploy to production like yes it's automated but it still takes a lot of time to get to each environment test validate etc cetera, etc cetera. so um it's always good to always to, to have some kind of a backdoor maybe it just one person has the permission to do it but have a way to actually skip everything if it's needed and go to production at least for now we haven't had to do it but we're conscious that something might happen that requires us to to bypass everything we've built on our own and just say ignore the rules now and just deploy what we have we we we, are, we acknowledge that it's a risk but we probably have a bigger problem on production that has to be resolved immediately yeah that makes a lot of sense yeah Just to add a little bit on this uh, topic that Stian mentioned, some of the stuff, but also we are trying to not go live with, the, let's say, a new feature. If we can in advance figure out a way to fall back to another method of doing the same thing. So we could have a ready feature which could go live and not go live with it until we have exhausted all the possible um, uh, shortcuts to to another solution for example or if there if we figured that's a pretty dangerous point of failure we can avoid having troubles in here if we have let's say if this fails go ahead and do this other stuff that we've prepared i don't want to go into uh, big details on what i'm talking about but in theory it's it this applies for all the features that you introduce also if you try to keep and be as minimalistic as possible not use services which are an overkill for a, for an issue you have or um, you're using one or two percent of the fit of the service um, um, capabilities um, that's just another point of failure you're introducing to your application if you can uh, just go ahead and do it the way that sounds like more suitable for this problem that's solve this problem and nothing else you you won't have a bunch of other stuff packed in there that wouldn't do anything you wouldn't make use of it that may just introduce a breaking point thank you very much yep adel Yes, so I think that concludes um, the end of our session today. A big thank you um, to News UK for sharing your journey with us and giving us plenty of insight um, during that discussion today. And thanks to everyone that tuned in and joined us live during their lunch break. Um, we really appreciate it. Uh, we have been recording the session, so this will be shared after by email. Um, and yes, feel free to join us um, again for our next event, which is going to be on the 19th of May. Um, it will be an evening session um, where we'll be talking about building high performing teams um, and reliable systems and giving you a little bit of a recipe for success um, we have our guest speaker charity major and um, the CTO of Honeycomb who'll be joining us um, so yeah it'll be a, a really great session so please do register it is now live on our meetup page and um, so head on over to there and um, we look to see you at the next event thanks everyone for joining <laughs>